So today's workshop is on evaluating websites for research. And if you have um, seen this before, it will seem very, very familiar. I say the same thing different ways and explain it in different ways throughout this. So if you have questions, please use the chat box. I'll have a couple of times during the presentation that I will stop and I will look at chat. However, I cannot keep chat up at the same time that I have the PowerPoint displaying in such a way that I can show you the videos and click on the links. Um, so don't worry if I don't see your question right away, just bear with me and we'll go with it. Okay. So one last check on chat to make sure, yeah, it's not gonna let me show it. Okay, so when you are heading in to um, take a look for information on the web, we all tend to just go to Google, see what we can see, check through there, maybe try to find um, the best of what we can find. When you're using websites for academic research, you wanna go deeper because you want to build your work on solid foundations. So how do you do that? Well, first, some notes on this presentation itself. I am teaching this on my own. Um, so I ask that you keep your microphone muted until question time. Again, this has a tendency, um, I have a tendency to be like that cat distracted by that shiny crinkly thing. And I'll be like, oh, wait, what were we talking about? And get lost. So let's not do that to each other. Um, and <clears throat> so heading into this, we consume information daily. And that means basically that we take it in, we chew through it, we figure out how we can use it or not, and then we use it in some way. And most of us don't chew our food thoroughly, um, really, quite honestly, when it comes to consuming information. So um, a lot of times what we end up chatting about or, or using in our research or sharing on Facebook or on Twitter or Instagram is not necessarily the truth. So how can you tell that? There's a quote usually attributed to the writer Mark Twain that goes, a lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its shoes. Funny thing about that, there's reason to doubt that Mark Twain ever said this at all, thus ironically proving the point. And today the quote, whoever said it, is truer than ever before. In previous decades, most media with global reach consisted of several major newspapers and networks which had the resources to gather information directly. Outlets like Reuters and the Associated Press that aggregate or re-report stories were relatively rare compared to today. The speed with which information spreads now has created the ideal conditions for a phenomenon known as circular reporting. This is when Publication A publishes misinformation, Publication B reprints it, and Publication A then cites B as the source for the information. It's also considered a form of circular reporting when multiple publications report on the same initial piece of false information, which then appears to another author as having been verified by multiple sources. For instance, the 1998 publication of a single pseudoscientific paper arguing that routine vaccination of children causes autism inspired an entire anti-vaccination movement, despite the fact that the original paper has repeatedly been discredited by the scientific community. Deliberately unvaccinated children are now contracting contagious diseases that had been virtually eradicated in the United States, with some infections proving fatal. In a slightly less dire example, satirical articles that are formatted to resemble real ones can also be picked up by outlets not in on the joke. For example, a joke article in the reputable British Medical Journal entitled Energy Expenditure in Adolescents Playing New Generation Computer Games has been referenced in serious science publications over 400 times. User-generated content, such as wikis, are also a common contributor to circular reporting. As more writers come to rely on such pages for quick information, an unverified fact in a wiki page can make its way into a published article that may later be added as a citation for the very same wiki information, making it much harder to debunk. 
recent advances in communication technology have had immeasurable benefits in breaking down the barriers between information and people. But our desire for quick answers may overpower the desire to be certain of their validity. And when this bias can be multiplied by billions of people around the world nearly instantaneously, more caution is in order. Avoiding sensationalist media, searching for criticisms of suspicious information, and tracing the original source of a report can help slow down a lie, giving the truth more time to put on its shoes. So as you can see, sometimes it's a little difficult to untangle the truth from fiction out there. Um, when you're looking at websites, there are many, many, many different ways that people approach information. And sometimes it's very hard to tell what's useful and what isn't. So there are three general categories that I sort of put websites into as a way of determining if something is useful. Starting right off the bat, is it unsuitable to what, the question that you're answering? If you go out there and you have research and you're trying to find data, if it's unsuitable, simply don't use it. Is it subjective? Which means it's tied to uh, individual or personal experience, not necessarily to uh, research that can be um, tested and proven. Or false, just flat out lies. Um, the only time you should use these websites is if that's actually the topic of your research and you're using them understanding that the slant or bias or falsity of that information. One of the ways this happens is via parody. Um, so sites made for human, humor, <laughs> humans, all of them are made for humans except the ones made for cats. The um, websites made for humor or satire can be pretty obvious if you have cultural awareness. Sometimes we don't. Um, sometimes people will read a parodical site or a satirical site and not realize that what they're looking at is not actually truth. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of this. Starting off with The Onion. This is um, a parody site, and parody is intended to um, poke fun at a figure or an event or some institution in order to draw attention to it, right? You can tell where I shop. And when you look at this, as a United States citizen, as an American, as a person who reads American news, I can tell pretty quickly um, that some of these are obviously false. An unemployment, unemployed man is getting really good at being unemployed. That's not really how it works. But some of them might be a little tougher. Um, humans began domesticating animals to comfort children whose parents split up. If you're thinking about this from the perspective of 2020, at first glance, that might actually make sense. Until you realize that they're talking about prehistory and domestication of cats to catch vermin or dogs to guard animals. <laughs> that doesn't make quite as much sense. This one looks like it could truly be legitimate. The US Census, which is conducted every 10 years, will be conducted in 2020. And the process of documenting American citizens is not without its share of historical issues and controversies. Not only is that factually correct, but it sounds like a news source. This can fool people all too often. Um, not that long ago, the leader of North Korea um, or people working on his behalf in social media touted a story from the onion as being complimentary to their leader, when in actual fact, it was quite the opposite. And they didn't know because they didn't realize that it was a parody news site. It was not an actual news site. Another example of this would be the rising wasabi. I happen to like Japanese culture and Japanese food, and I have a lot of friends who are Japanese. Wasabi is a very, spicy condiment that you can only have a little bit of it before it burns your tongue. Um, the Rising Wasabi is a satirical site that you can only read a little bit of it before it burns your brain. <laughs> so when you take a look at this, some of them are obviously funny, but might be true. Japan to send two toilet paper rolls to every household. As an American, I am probably geographically ignorant. I may think this is perfectly legitimate. However, this one, the Olympics postponement causes 5,491 people to immediately test positive for coronavirus. It is true that the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo have been postponed. This would not cause a spontaneous outbreak of coronavirus. Testing, maybe, <laughs> but not coronavirus. 
And the underlying satire in that is poking fun at people who are not getting tested because they fear that it will keep them from living their normal lives. Meanwhile, if they live their normal lives and they are asymptomatic with the coronavirus, they could actually be infecting other people. So one of the purposes of a parodic or satirical site is to draw attention to a problem or problem as perceived by people writing this. So beware of parody. It's funny, but it can have problems. Another issue, <coughs> pardon me, that you find in um, some websites um, are uh, protest sites that have a deliberate and specific slant or bias. And that is because they are taking a side on an issue of perceived injustice. So because of this, they're going to target specific issues or people. An example of this is Fight for the Future. This is a beautifully produced website that is specifically created to draw attention to issues that this group considers to be extremely important. It also has an about us, which is a good thing to take note of. Any group that is open about who they are uh, may be more trustworthy than a group that tries to hide who they are, but always investigate it. Because when you click about us in this case, it talks about the mission of this particular website, of this particular group, but it doesn't actually give any contact information or any names. To do that, you have to go elsewhere. So this is about us in the sense of the organization, but not in the sense of the creators of the content. So you have to dig a little bit. Another is freepress.org. Notice that both of these are .org, and I'll talk more about domain a little bit later in the presentation. In freepress.org, they also have a specific slant or bias. And you can tell pretty quickly by looking at their headlines what that is. So if you use information from a source that has such an obvious and specific bias, be aware of that and find information from the other side of that particular event or person or whatever it is that they're talking about so that when you present your paper, presentation, speech, whatever it is, you have looked at the entire topic and can give a balanced presentation and have a more full understanding of your topic. The next category is scams. This is sometimes the uh, most difficult of all of the categories of website problems that you can come across. And that's because they're deliberately designed to fool you into thinking that they're legitimate. Most of the time, they're using uh, clickbait headlines, um, sensational wording, um, anything that looks like they might grab your attention because when you click on those sites, they get money. Um, or they might be phishing, um, which means that they're trying to get information from you, identification information, your social security number, your bank account number, in order to uh, defraud you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> you can check these sites on a Google site called Transparency Report. And that is this URL right here. By the way, uh, this will be up on a video on the library webpage when it's done, so you'll be able to come back and make note of these URLs and use them later. So if I wanted to check and see if the SMC library website was legitimate or not, or if it was a phishing scam, I could go here to this transparency report website and I would type in my URL, spell it right, and then search it. And what this does is Google searches to see if there's any malware, malignant or malicious um, software, phishing software on that site. So it comes up and it says, this was last checked today. There was no unsafe content found. So before you give anyone any information for anything, I would highly recommend if you're on the web, which we all are right now, to check it for safety. Because these sites can look very legitimate and are very much not so. So what do you look for when you're looking for um, information on a web page to say, this is useful, this is not? Um, it all looks good. So how do you pick the good from the just pretending to be good? Starting off with who is responsible for the information on that website? Are they an expert? 
not the web administrator or designer, but the person responsible for the content. And what are they actually saying? Um, experts often disagree on things. One of these sort of founding precepts of science is that you ask the same question to test the answer to see if the answer changes. And a lot of times, especially when things are formulating or changing rapidly, experts will disagree and that's healthy. And you need to include that in your understanding of the topic and your presentation of your results in your essay or whatever it may be. So if they are, or even if they're not, depending on what they're actually saying, are they citing their sources? Are they telling you where they got their information? If it's a primary resource and they actually did research, did, do they tell you about how they did it? If they're reporting on someone else's research, do you, they give you a link to that other research? Can you follow it up? Hint, do. <laughs> Always follow links to see where they go. Why are they putting, oh, I'm sorry, where did they get that information? Um, look for objectivity, not subjectivity. We are human beings and as such, we view the world through a veil of prejudice, positive, negative, and neutral. So you have to filter out that slant or bias as much as you possibly can when you're doing this information search. Um, and the way you do that is by balancing it with opposing or disagreeing or alternate viewpoints as you go in. Because if you get enough different viewpoints, what they all have in common will end up being that kernel of truth that you're looking for. It costs money to put information up on a website, to maintain it, to allow access to it. So why are they spending that money? Why are they putting that site up? What do they get out of it? <clears throat> when was it last updated? Is the information still relevant or has it um, become outdated and been replaced by other information that is um, more useful? And how do they present the information? So this is question time. So I'm gonna stop sharing for just a sec. And this will allow me to actually check the chat and see if there are any questions. And I don't see any, any is everybody doing okay out there? Okay. I see a couple of yeses and one green light, yay. Okay, not seeing any questions, I'm going to plow on forward into the next part. So <clears throat> let me share my screen with you again. Now that you've sort of gotten an idea of how you break things apart to look at them, the very first thing that you look at is authority, expertise. Can I trust this person? And that's what this video is addressing. So you're doing research. How do you decide who to trust and which information to accept or leave behind? Let's take a look. You're probably already an authority on something. Your friends may go to you for advice and guidelines on how to do certain things, like calculus or how to make great chili. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're an expert on the subject or that everyone should trust you or your cooking, but it does mean that your social circle has come to recognize you as the one to go to for certain things. Your friends may love your chili, but you might enter it into a competition with professional cooks and find that you've got a lot to learn. The same kind of thing goes for your academic knowledge. You might be a knowledgeable and useful tutor to your peers, but try to apply for a job as a calculus professor and you'll find your way out of your element. That's because you're trying to function in a new and different community. Systems of authority, trust, and reliability can look different in a variety of groups. Figuring out who to trust also depends on your information need. If you're writing an in-depth research paper on action movies and evolving gender roles, you'll probably need to use library databases and investigate some scholarly articles written by experts on that topic. But if you're just trying to decide if you should spend a few bucks at a movie theater, you can read reviews online, potentially written by anyone. It doesn't have to be a professor of gender studies or film criticism. But even in these simple cases, you might decide that you trust one reviewer over another. Why is that? Is it because you already agreed with their point of view? Think carefully about why you decide to trust any information and don't take anything for granted. Be flexible and open to new evidence from a variety of voices, not just those that confirm your worldview. Since this idea gets pretty complicated and we don't want you to doubt everything all the time 
or else you'd never get out of bed in the morning. Here's some ways to figure out if information is authoritative in the academic world. Here's a short list of tips, and no single question is enough to ask when you're examining information. Who is the author or creator of this information, and why is this person qualified to write on this topic? Is this information peer-reviewed? This means that other experts had a chance to take a closer look and offer suggestions and approval before the article or book was published. Does the author offer evidence that supports what they're telling you? And is there other information out there that helps confirm this evidence? As you go through your academic career, you'll develop more expertise on a subject, and you may even be recognized as an authority one day. It's your responsibility to make sure that you're using the best possible information in an ethical way and connecting with your community and others in order to share your own knowledge. And that's how you inform your thinking. So we're going to start with an example. And before I get into that, you'll notice um, that I've added an extra little uh, word here to my Google search. This is what's called a domain limiter. And a, don a domain is um, the last three letters at the end of your URL. And what that tells you is who is responsible for that content um, and what sector of industry or education they're in. So a site limiter tells Google, I only want you to find information from educational sites. That would be site colon dot edu or nonprofit or not-for-profit organizations, site colon dot org, or US governmental information, site colon dot gov. So if you add a site or a domain limiter to your search, you will force Google to only look for information from those information providers. Please be wary. If you use site colon dot edu, that information provider has proven to the people who hand out these domains that they are indeed uh, a school or a university or a college or an educational um, entity of some sort. But that could be anything from a research university to kindergarten. <laughs> so be aware of the level of your information as well. Um, I've had students in uh, scholars history classes before use websites that they thought were perfectly fine and when their teacher took a look at them and finished laughing and graded them down, it was because those websites were actually, in one example, a class project from a middle school. So good information, but not appropriate to college level research. So be aware, always ask those questions. Don't um, ever rely on like answering one of those questions to determine if you can trust it or not. Okay. So I'm going to go into a little bit more depth on those questions right now. Um, <clears throat> When we talk about who is responsible for that information, we're saying, what are their credentials? Do they have a degree or other qualifications? Have they worked in that field for 30 years? Are they an innovator who's known in that field? Um, have they published before on this? And what sort of um, things have they published in? Have they published in scholarly journals? Have they published in trade magazines, et cetera? Um, and given the information you can find out about the author, do you think they're an expert? Yes use it? No, don't use it. Need more information to figure it out? Do some more research about this person and try to find out. What are they actually saying? Well, is the website subjective or objective? Is it factual or opinion-based? Or both. And oftentimes there are a little bit of both, so be careful what parts of the website you end up using. And if you have something that you really want to use in your essay and you're like, but it really is kind of an opinion, just make note of that when you write about it. Say, you know, this really struck a chord with me. And that way you're showing your teacher, you know, this is not objective fact, but it was also important to your research and it informed you on your topic. Is the information in that website balanced? Um, and if it's not, does it have links to the other side of the argument? For example, there's a, a website from the Catholic Church called Catholics for Choice. Um, they stand against some of the precepts of their own organization. And they have links to both sides of the question because their purpose is partly to put forward their agenda and partly to encourage people to think about what they're saying. And you think best about something if you know more about it. Okay? And then if they cite information, are those good links? 
because many times people will be quoted out of context and then you'll find out later when you actually track down that original paper that yes, that author did say that quote, but when you put it in context, it has a completely different meaning. So that's very important to keep in mind. Is there an easy way to contact the author? So for example, that one website that we looked at, it had about us, but it didn't have any contact information. What is the domain? Is it an educational one? Is it a commercial one? Is it government information? Is it something else? Okay. And there are other things. Um, and if it's coming from a publisher, if it is uh, supported like it's an article in a, a web blog or a, a web uh, journal, what does that publisher usually publish? Do they usually publish scholarly things? Are they usually um, a university press? Are they a commercial or a trade publisher? Um, are they part of a professional organization like the American Medical Association or the American um, Psychological Association? Are they a non-profit or not-for-profit? Um, Nonprofits and not-for-profits have specific purposes, so they will have an inherent slant or bias, just like many do, but theirs will be um, quite often more uh, pronounced, more deliberate, because they are trying to raise awareness and often money to support or fight a particular thing, right? <coughs> Sorry. And is it a personal website? This doesn't necessarily disqualify it if it's a personal website. For example, when I was doing my thesis um, for uh, my second master's, um, I went to a blog quite often because this blog was being done by a professor at MIT who was doing cutting edge research in my field. So I was able to talk with him and find out information about him um, on areas that hadn't even been published yet. So it all goes back to who is the information coming from. If that person is an expert, even their personal website might be a good place to get good information. But if you cannot find credentials for a person, don't trust them. It doesn't matter how many YouTube videos they put up. It doesn't how, matter how many followers they have. That just means they can talk and people like what they're hearing. That doesn't necessarily mean they're an expert. So try to find their credentials. I'm going to answer questions in just a sec. I see some really good ones coming up in chat. Time is important because information has a shelf life, especially when it comes to news. So when you look at a website, when is that information actually published or copyrighted? And I'm talking about the information, not the website, because oftentimes the webmaster will go through, make sure all the links still work, make sure nobody's bombed them, whatever. Um, but the information, actually the content of the website might be a year or two or five years old. If it's older, it's historical. <coughs> Pardon me. And if you know it's historical, you can use it in that context. You can say, this is a snapshot of how it was in 2015. Then update it with other news sources. If it cites primary research, in other words, it talks about a study or um, an experiment that was done, Try to find out when that experiment was done. I mentioned earlier that in science, they ask a question over and over and over again, partly to see if the results that they get when they do their um, experiments are replicable, but also partly to make sure that the answer hasn't changed over time. So if that answer has changed, you wanna make sure that you get both the historical perspective and the current perspective. And an example here is how gender difference is viewed by the psychological um, profession. Even as uh, late as 10 years ago, certain things um, like placement along the gender spectrum were actually considered um, psychological disorders. And today with a better understanding of how the psyche works and how gender works, they're not. So if you don't get the most current information, you could be missing very important pieces of information and you could be basing your um, research and your uh, ideas and your presentation and your critical analysis on information that is not the best, okay? If it is current, cool, look at your topic. Is it important for your topic that it be current? If I'm doing an art history paper and my subject is Caravaggio, it could be a hundred years old and still be quite useful, okay? 
That is determined by the question you're asking, by the topic of your paper. <clears throat> I apologize. And finally, for this one, why did the author write the content? Are they trying to educate people about something, either for action or because they are educators? Are they trying to uh, sway opinion and persuade people to agree with them? Are they just going absolutely crazy in shelter in place and need to entertain people? Um, are they trying to sell you something? And that could be merchandise, it could be an opinion, it could be a vote, or something else. What are they trying to sell you on? Lastly, look at how it's actually written. What kind of language is used by the author? Is it formal, academic? Um, is it informal, colloquial, everyday language? Is it specialized to a specific discipline or a specific industry? That tells you about the audience that the author is trying to reach. And does it include any sort of primary research like an experiment or a survey or outreach like interviews? Any secondary research like data or statistical analysis or a literature review? And does it have links to other appropriate and useful websites? When you put it all together, based on what you determine with these questions, you ask yourself, should I rely on the information that I find on this website for my essay? Why or why not? Anytime you use information, you should be able to articulate a good reason why. And if you can't, it might well be that you're relying on your own opinions or your own biases. So check those because you wanna make sure that you understand your topic as fully as possible, because only when you understand your topic fully can you write and present intelligently about it, okay? And if after doing all of this, you're still like, I don't know, it might be me, it might be that it looks really good, I just, I don't know. Ask the experts, talk to your instructor, see if you can track down the people who wrote that article. And here on the library homepage, use the Ask a Librarian button. This is 24 seven research assistance from librarians, either Santa Monica College librarians or college and university librarians from other colleges and universities. Anyone you get hold of when you click on Ask a Librarian will be a college or university librarian and they will be happy to help you, okay? Now I'm gonna take a quick pause here and answer some chat questions, because I noticed we have a few, which is wonderful. Does it make it less credible if it's hard to contact the author? Yes, <laughs> short answer. Um, and the reason why I say that is because um, if the author is a reputable author, they will welcome questioning. If you can't contact them, or their publisher, or a person who represents them, in other words, if there's no way to actually get in contact with them, then there's no way to verify their credentials, really. You can look at other sources, outside sources, but um, heading back to my own experience with my thesis, some of the best stuff that I got was when I reached out to producers and writers and asked them directly, what did you mean by this? And I was able to track them down and they were able to give me feedback. If you can't get that kind of connection, be a bit suspicious. And don't sort of like accept, oh, well, I tried one, it didn't work, because maybe they worked at this institution and now they're working somewhere else. So think outside of that web page when you try to find that information. Very good. Um, any other chat questions? If the topic is still fairly new, um, and gosh knows that's happening, um, what counts as credible and how do I know that what they tell me back is true? Um, one of the best ways to determine if something is credible is to look at multiple sources and also look at the credibility of the person giving you this information. So uh, I'll use this as an example. Um, I was on a Facebook page the other day and I posted something that was from Dr. Fauci, who is um, one of the lead virologists in the United States. <clears throat> and someone immediately posted back and said that his opinion couldn't be trusted. He was a bad guy. And I didn't get defensive about it. I wanted to know why this person thought that. So I wrote back and I said, you know, based on what? Tell me, your, tell me your, um, where you're getting this from. And the person posted a video. 
So I went and I watched the video and I thought, well, she's very passionate, but I couldn't find anything about the woman in the video. I had no idea who she was. I didn't know where her credentials were. And when I got back on the, on the um, blog and I said, well, when I look at about her, all I find is her opinions and requesting money. Yes, she has a lot of followers and she's very popular, but I can't figure out anything about who she is. And the person that I was having this discussion with posted back by posting more videos by the same person. So they're going back to the website to determine the credibility of the source when that website gave no evidence for credibility for that source. So I was able to go for Dr. Fauci, I was able to go to um, the World Health Organization website and go to a couple of websites for US organizations, including the CDC. And I was able to find out information about his background and his history and said, this is why I trust him as an expert. Even though what he's talking about is brand new, and um, so the topic itself is very uh, fluid and not yet settled, coronavirus. Um, the fact that he has um, experience for the past 30 years um, with AIDS, with the Ebola crisis, with other virus um, crises, makes me more willing to trust his word than a self-professed researcher with no contact information and no outside validation of credentials. So um, one of the ways that you can definitely count to see if something is credible is not to look at the topic, but to look at the producer of the information about that topic. Does that make sense? Okay, excellent. I think that's caught up. Yeah, I can speak English. That's catching up on all the chats. So here's some examples of some um, bad websites, bad, bad websites. This is one of my favorites because I think it's hilarious. It might be offensive to religious people in particular areas, so I apologize in advance. But when you look at this, especially in an age where we're all at a distance, you might actually think that this is something that the Catholic Church has put up to try to give their parishioners some comfort until you actually look at some of the links. And then you're like, hmm, sloth, I'm definitely having a problem with that. Proceed to confessional. You have not confessed any sins yet. If it starts feeling like you're being circular, back out, not a good website. Another one that I find um, rather funny is Bandersnatch. Welcome to America's only genuine diploma mill. Something like this is pretty obvious that it's not a very good website, but something like this can be confused with true news. And that goes back to what we talked about with satire and parody. So just be very careful when you go out there to make sure that what you're getting is not someone's attempt at humor passed off as news. So how do you check your facts? Well, there are fact checkers for that. And the nice thing about fact checkers is you can check them out as well. Take a look at the arguments that they give when they're uh, giving um, information about particular questions. So for example, factcheck.org, it's not letting me do this for some reason. So let me go back in. And I'm just gonna type it in, factcheck.org. The Annenberg School is part of uh, University of Southern California and has an excellent reputation um, among communication programs out there. So that's one thing you can check, who is publishing it. Then you can take a look and see what types of information that they're talking about. Now, what I find interesting about this when I come across it right off the bat, they will tell me I had this story that I was wondering about and this fact check says that this Democrat's response was incorrect. And then I have this story that they checked on and this said this Republican's facts are incorrect. So right off the bat, I can tell they're not necessarily taking a partisan stand. They're looking at things that come up. I'm gonna click on one to take a look at how they do it. They take a look at the question they come up with an, a short answer. 
And then as you go down, they will give the full answer. And within the full answer, they will give you links to further information. So they will actually link to articles or to messages or to experts. And this is how they got their information. And they will show you exactly where they came up with their determination on this question, whether it was factual or not. And they go into some depth when they do their fact checking. So organizations like this, fact, checker, fact checkers like this, are a good place to go um, if you're unsure about the facts that you find. There are also some helpful guides out there. Starting off with the one that we have here at Santa Monica College, which is a guide specifically to evaluating research. And I want to, uh, websites, sorry, and I want to point out something as we look at a couple of these. You'll notice the questions look very familiar. When I go to the guide from Harvard, it's presented a little bit differently, but again, it's very familiar. And also on Harvard, they have a similar um, guide to evaluating journal articles and a more general guide to evaluating information from any source. And then finally, the one from Columbia, much the same questions. The reason why I point this out is because your brain is kind of like a muscle. And the more often you use this critical analysis, critical evaluation for every piece of information that crosses your eyes, the faster and more automatic it becomes, the better you become at evaluating information. And eventually, it will, be, it will literally come to a point where you'll be reading through something and you'll, your spidey sense will tingle. And you'll be like, something about this seems off. Um, and you actually get sort of a feel for something that doesn't seem quite right. And at that point, you investigate further, right? So train yourself. It's like muscle memory for your brain. And now it is question time. So let me head back to chat. I don't see any other questions. Does anybody have any questions from the presentation today that they would like to ask at this point? Okay. Now, if you're here for extra credit, you can tell your instructor something interesting that you have learned, or you can use the code word. And the code word for today's workshop is SENKU, S-E-N-K-U. This word has no context within this. So if you present that to your teacher and say, this is the code word that um, Professor Antrim gave you, now, how long does it take for you to research? <laughs> I'm a research geek, so, um, and I'm also a fan writer and just like a fun writer, so I can dive into the research hole and never pull myself out of the whirlpool. So for your, as students, what you need to do when you're doing your research is you need to plan your time. You need to make sure that you have enough time to actually find articles, to find websites, to do some background information checking a reasonable amount of background information checking, which is the who, the how, the when, the why, et cetera, what we covered in here, and be able to synthesize it, come up with good ideas, critical analysis, and present that. And that's one of the reasons why your teachers say start early doing your research, because research takes time. Research and evaluation take time. There is no set answer to how long to do your research. It depends on your project. If you're in an eight-week class and you have to do an essay, you may only have a week. And within that week, you may need to do all of it. Um, if you're in a 16 week class, you may have two months. If you're working on a larger project for a portfolio and a capstone class at the end, you may have two years. So my best answer for that is do your research until you're satisfied with the answer. And if you feel like you've done an appropriate amount of research and you're still not satisfied with your answer, Ask a librarian, talk to your teacher, ask the discipline experts to give you some guidance because you don't want to waste all of your writing time doing research. And I see I have a Dr. Stone fan in the audience. Yeah. So any questions at all on anything that we have covered today? Thank you very, very much 
for coming to um, this workshop, and I hope you find it um, of good use when you do your research. Be well.